Make sure your Bibles are still open to Exodus chapter 19. Again, looking at the children of Israel heading to the promised land. And today we're looking there. It says, he brought them out of the camp to meet with God. To meet with God. Amazing thing in verse number one, just by way of introduction, by the way, I believe you're going to have to come back tonight to get the rest of the message. Uh, what you have in your hand is the introduction. Uh, and I'm glad you're glad about that. But uh, some things to lay in place. But you need to be back tonight to talk about how to prepare better for a meeting with God. But notice, first of all, there in verse number one, it says, in the third month. In other words, all we've been studying through Exodus, all we've been studying as they left Egypt has only been three months. Boy, you talk about a life that's changed in their life in three months. Three months prior to this, they were slaves. Three months prior to this, they were in bondage. Three months prior to this, uh, they had been beaten and abused and just tortured and just overworked and just slaves to the Egyptians. And now, in three months, they've gone from there to freedom. They've gone through some miraculous works. God had done miracles. God was changing their lives in just three months. Let me help you with something. If we'll just surrender to God, if you will just give your life to God, if you'll just give your heart completely to God, three months can make major changes in your life. Now, if you push back, it might be three years, it might be three decades, and not much is going to happen. But if you'll be like the children of Israel saying, here we go, we're leaving where we were, we're following you, we're doing what you want us to do, in three months, so much has changed, they've learned so much. So let me challenge you, if nothing else today, say, I'm going to start following I'm going to do whatever God says, however God leads. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to put a maybe onto it. I'm not going to evaluate to see whether or not I want to. I'm just going to do what God wants me to do. And you'd be surprised how much changes God can make in your life and in your family's life in just three months. But there they are, three months. And so God puts that little timetable to let us know how fast things are changing. And now, as we see in verse 17... They're getting ready to have a meeting with God. A meeting with God. Now, if you've been saved a long time, you say, well, that's not very significant. But if you pause to think about the idea of a human, flesh and blood, meeting with God, that's an amazing thing. That's a soul-stirring thing. That's a frightful thing. So here they are. They're preparing to have a meeting with God. And in this meeting with God, they're going to receive the law. They're going to receive the Ten Commandments. By the way, the Ten Commandments have always been written just in heaven, but now Moses was going to receive them and God was going to give them the Ten Commandments. Those commandments was going to change the world. Those commandments were going to change Israel. By the way, those commandments has changed the world. You look around, even before the law was given, the law was out there. The Bible talks about the Gentiles having the law written in their hearts. In other words, if you go to the deepest part of Africa, they'll still have the basic tenets. You don't kill people. You don't steal from people. You don't. It's just there, these things that are right. And so now they're going to give them the Ten Commandments, have it written down for them to live by. But before that, chapter 20 comes to the commandments. But in chapter 19, God is showing us how He dealt with them to prepare for those commandments, to prepare for God to speak to them, for prepare them to receive those commandments by preparing them to meet with God. So before we actually get on to how to prepare to meet for God, let me ask, how are your meetings with God coming? I pray every service almost that, we, that God would meet with us. By the way, that's one of the key reasons we come to church is to meet with God. Again, we know God. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit dwells inside. If you're saved, He's always with you. But God made a special promise where two or three are gathered there in His name. Jesus said He'll be in the midst. He's going to make a special presence, a special appearance, a special working. And so when we come to the house of God, we ought to be coming to have a meeting with God. By the way, you need to prepare for that. You need to prepare for a meeting with God. If you were going to have a, pres a meeting with the president, now we're not politics aside, but you're going to have a meeting with the president, I believe you would prepare for it. You wouldn't say, oh, time to go. Oh, we're going to be late. Hurry, just gather. No, you would stop. You'd say, what am I going to wear? How am I going to get my schedule done? Am I going to bathe first? And how am I going to get there? Am I going to get my car clean? Am I? You'd prepare for the meeting. What am I going to say? What questions would I ask? You would prepare because it's significant meeting to you. If you're going for a, that big job, the job you've been looking for, the job you've been wanting for, you would prepare for it. 
If you've done any job applications like that, you go study the company, find out what the company does, find out their strengths, find out their weaknesses, find out where they're going, and you would prepare yourself. You would dress a certain way. You would have a special spirit. You'd be all prepared for it. If it's a special meeting with somebody in your workplace, you would prepare for that. Ladies and gentlemen, when we come to the house of God, we've got to remember, we're coming for a meeting with God. We want God to do a work. We want God to change lives. We want God to work in our hearts. We need to come prepared. And so you prepare for it. You just don't just drop what you're doing and come to church. You pray and you prepare. So they're preparing now for a meeting with God. That's what he says in verse 17. He said that God, he brought them out to prepare to have a meeting with God. So by way of introduction, again, you have to come back probably tonight. I always leave the option if God changes my mind uh, throughout the afternoon to, to another message. But I believe tonight we'll be looking at that real final preparation. But God lays out some principles for us to help us prepare. So let God speak to you. Whatever, whenever God speaks to you, write it down. Make a note. Put it in your Bible. Because sometimes it won't even be a point in the sermon. Sometimes it won't even be the emphasis or even a side note, but just some part of the Scripture, something I might say or something that you might, the Holy Spirit might say, that's for you that will change your life. So write it down and then follow up on your own studies. Well, this morning we're looking at this meeting with God. So here we are, wonderful things as God lays out some very basic tenets for us. First of all, we see the purposed trip. The purposed trip. In other words, this trip had a purpose. They're out there in the wilderness. They're not, headed to, they're not in Canaan land yet. God brought them to Mount Sinai. He brought them to that mountain where He was going to give them the commandments. He said before they took them to the rest of the way of the promised land. But there's a purpose to that trip. Look at verse number 4. He said, ye have seen God's telling Moses to tell the people. He said, Moses, you tell them this. He said, you people, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. He said, you saw all the curses. You saw how the, how the death angel moved through. You saw all that. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. What was God's purpose in this trip? To bring them to himself. Oh, would you be and think about it? To bring them to himself. God had done all those things. God had done all those things to the Egyptians. He brought them through on eagles' wings. He had taken them through all those things for the purpose of bringing them to him. Oh, I tell you what, when I begin thinking about that, I get, I get excited about it. That God would want to spend time with me. That God would want to bring me to him. The Bible three or four times says throughout, what is man? What is man compared to God? It says in Psalms 8, verse number 3, When I consider the heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man? He said, what am I? who am I? Even as the King David said, who am I? That thou art mindful of him, and the Son of Man that thou visitest him. The psalmist David was saying, he said, I can't imagine you being a powerful God, you who created the universe with just your word, and me being so lowly and just flesh and blood. Who am I that you would care about? Who am I that you would, <clears throat> excuse me, think about? Who am I that you would visit? God with us. Jehovah with us. In fact, that's what Jesus' name was. God with us. Oh, what an amazing thing that God would be. Are you out there this morning? I tell you, it'd be one thing if the president wanted to meet with you. It'd be another thing if you're, the mayor wanted to meet with you. But God wants to meet with you. So the purpose of this trip that he brought him to this place wasn't just so God could have something to write about. Wouldn't be something just to fill in a few pages there here in Exodus. It was that they would be brought to him. It's amazing that God would want to do that. The real question is, the statement is, we should have a great desire to be with Him. Are you listening? We, as humble human beings, we as flesh and blood, have a God who wants to spend time with us. It should be in our hearts to say, I want to spend time with Him. I want to know Him. If He's willing to answer my prayer, if He's willing to let me come to Him, if He's willing to let me spend time with Him, if He's willing to let me draw near to Him, boy, I want to do that. That should be a natural desire for us to spend time with Him. But the problem is, in man's fallen nature, we don't want that. We don't want to spend time with God. This old world doesn't want to spend time with God. You and I, because of sin in our life, we're just, well, it's our fallen nature. 
When Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God. When sin entered into their hearts, when sin entered into their lives, they fled from God. I tell you, it's an amazing thing. I see people, as they walk down this street, flee from God. You try to invite them to church, and boy, it's like you were just pulled a gun on them. Boy, they say, no, 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 I'm fine. I, I know. Or they'll just laugh. Or they'll start crossing the other side of the street so you won't talk to them. They're fleeing from God. You say, meet them at the door, knocking some doors yesterday, inviting folks to church, trying to witness to them. And boy, I tell you what, it'd be like you're trying to sell them uh, Edsel's. I don't know how many people know Edsel's, but it's... It's an amazing thing. They do not want to spend time with God. Fall in the nature is to hide from God. But we should have a desire as God's people. I want to spend time with Him. So God's purpose trip was, the purpose of the trip, His purpose was to bring them to Him. By the way, when we think of the path to Him, it's only by the will of God and His desire we can approach Him. Are you listening to me? It's only by the will of God and His desire and willingness can we approach Him. He's God. So powerful, so mighty, so high. He has to come down to meet with us. He has to come down to spend time with us. And it's only by His desire, only by His will, that we can have that time with Him. You say, I want to meet with God. I demand it. You're not going to demand to meet with God. I demand to do it this way. God, you meet with me on my terms. No, if we're going to meet with God, it's because God desires it, because God wants it, and it's going to be on His terms. Oh, I tell you what, we spend so much time telling God how He ought to do things. So, many, so much time telling God how he ought to run things instead of saying, God, how do you want it? His path is the fact it's only by the will of God. It's only by his desire. And it's only by his terms can we approach him. That's how it was for the children of Israel. Slaves, and God says, I've done this to bring you to me. By the way, it's true then and it's true now. For us today to come to God, the only way is through salvation. Amen? Salvation is how God has provided a way for us to come to Him. And that path is the cross of Jesus Christ. That path for us to access Him, for us to come to Him, is through the blood of Jesus Christ dripping off the, the rugged old cross. That's why the Bible says in Colossians 1.20, And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things to Himself by Himself, I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in heaven, that you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and reproachable, unreproachable in his sight. The only way we have access to God is through the flesh of Jesus Christ. Through the torn flesh of Jesus Christ. God says, I want to make a way, and here's the only way that you're going to have access to me is by the blood and the torn flesh of Jesus Christ. He's made a way. You say, preacher, I don't want it that way. I want to work my way. It doesn't work that way. You have to come on his terms. Well, I'm going to be a, such a good person, and I'm going to go to church all the time, and I'm going to give Lighthouse Baptist Church all my money. Well, let's talk. No, we're not going to do that. No, it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2.12, well, in verse 16, we almost read it all, it says, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The purpose of the trip for the children of Israel to this point was to bring him to him. And he said, now that you're here, I'm going to give you the commandments. Today, that path is Jesus Christ. Not only is it the path, but it's the plan. You know, it all comes to Jesus Christ. Our path to God is through Jesus Christ. The plan for God is Jesus Christ. In John 12, 32, Jesus said, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. 
Oh, the plan is that we would magnify, lift up Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, if I go to the cross, I will draw men unto me. God's desire is for us to know Him. God's desire is us to walk with Him. God's desire is to have that fellowship with Him. But the only way for us to do that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way to do that is when Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross. And the plan is for the rest of the world to be drawn by lifting Him up. So we find His purposes. His purposes. But not only that, we see a promise. I think about His promise when He wants us to come to Him. Jesus said in John 14, 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Aren't you glad we got a promise as the children of God? We're going to be with Him. With Him. What is man that thou art mindful? What is man that he would die for our sins? It's one thing he would die for our sins so we don't have to go to hell. I mean, we get upset if we see somebody torture a dog. And we might stop them from torturing a dog or hurting a bird or hurting an animal. But we wouldn't want to spend the rest of eternity with them. But God died on the cross to pay our sin debt, not just so we don't have to go to hell, but so we can be with Him for all eternity. What is man that thou art mindful of Him? What is man that you would desire to be with Him? What is man that you would come and visit with Him? I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, we ought to be jumping for joy. We ought to be focused and rejoicing in Him all the time because He has a desire to us to be with Him. Amen. All right, they got the purpose trip. His purpose was to bring him to him. Number two, he says we see their portage. Their portage. Uh, by the way, I hope you're on that trip. Oh, I hope you're on that trip. You're following him so you can be with God, so you can be with Christ. If you're not saved, you need to be saved today so you can spend an eternity with him. But as we go on life, we're going with him to be drawn to him. So he is purpose, then is portage. Look at verse number four. God tells Moses, you will tell the people, you have seen what I have done to the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. How did they get there? On eagles' wings. On eagles' wings. They did not get there on their own ability. They did not get there on their own strength. They didn't get there on their own fortitude. God carried them as an eagle carries its young in its, on its wings. On eagle's wings. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about, here's a bunch of slaves just delivered out of slavery. They have no, they've not been on camping trips. They probably didn't have any Coleman lanterns. They didn't have any blow-up blow mattresses. They didn't know how to fight a war. Oh, they've been slaves. All they've been doing is making bricks for hundreds of years, generation after generation. They had none of that. And now all of a sudden they're going out and here they are. The Egyptian army's beginning to follow them, but they have no idea where they're going. They're just following the cloud, following the pillar of fire, doing what Moses says, and here we go. And follow. no idea how to get there. And they get to the Red Sea and says, what are we going to do now? How in the world are we going to get across here? God carried them over, parting the water and let them go through. And they get on their side, and the water was, was bitter. They couldn't drink it, and they were thirsty and afraid they were going to die of thirst, and God provided a way for that. Then they began to run out of food and desiring more food, and so God gave them the manna. Then they went to the water. They were running out of water, and God gave them water out of the rock. And then they went to their first battle, their first war, which we saw last week. Wow. And they made it through, and now they went from there, and now they come to this place that I brought you all through that so you can be with me, so I can have a meeting with you. He said, I had to bring you through that so you'd appreciate the meeting with me. And how they got there was by God. God carried them. He brought them. He ported them on eagles' wings. For the last three months, God's been carrying them. For the last three months, God has been providing for them. For the last three months, God has been doing miracles for them. It was only by the grace of God that they were able to make it. Through all the trials and dangers and necessities, God says, I brought you. Look at it again, verse number 4. And, the, and ye have seen what I did in the Egyptians and how I bear you. He said, you've seen it, how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you here. I like to think of them as wings of grace. 
wings of grace. God says, I'll carry you through those things. Oh, it may still be hot, may be still difficult, but I'll carry you through it. We sing that song, Amazing Grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. See, the children of Israel, how did they get there? They were carried there by God. You and I need to know, you and I need to remember that by faith, if we're following God, if we're letting Him lead us, if we're focused on Him and following that pillar that God gives us and following that fire that God has given us, following the Spirit, if we're following Him and doing Him, God will provide, God will protect, He will bear us over. When we're following Him, He will carry us also on eagles' wings. It says in Deuteronomy 32, verse number 10, Moses talking about this, He found Him in a desert place. And in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about. He instructed him. That's what he's doing to the children of Israel. He found him out there. He brought him out there. He led them. He instructed them. He kept him as the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth her broad her wings, and taketh them, beareth them on her wings. Preacher, how can I make it through the trials? How can I make it through this life? Make sure that you are following. Make sure you are doing what God, and as the special song there was, following Him, He will bear you over. Oh, I'm so glad that wherever He leads, He will bear and carry me over. Their portage was, the purpose was to be meeting with God, to be brought to the presence of God, and their portage through all those trials was on eagle's wings. Oh, I'm glad I don't have to make it myself. I'm glad I don't have to endure it myself. God will cover me very quickly. The purpose of the trip. Number two, a promise token. When we see as they got to this mountain, as God brings them to himself, we see a promised token. I believe it's in your notes. If you drift it off, you got to come back. You got to let your imagination work on this a little bit. As I began, meditated on that this week and stirred on this, boy, I just, I just can't imagine and yet I can because I've experienced things like it. There in your notes, Exodus 3.11, is that there? Yeah. Notice what it says. So in Exodus 3.11, if not, you can look back at it. Back when God was calling Moses at the burning bush, Moses had been 40 years taking care of the sheep, his father-in-law's sheep out in the wilderness. He saw the bush on fire, wasn't consumed. He said, I'm going to go see this. And God spoke to him out of the burning bush, and God called him to deliver Israel. He said, now's the time, and I'm going to use you to deliver Israel out of the Egyptians' hands. Verse 11, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly, God says to him, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee. He said, This is going to be a little proof for you. This is going to be a little tidbit for you. This is going to be a flag. The word token there means flag or beacon. He said, this will be a flag for you. This will be something you'll see and excite your heart. This will be a little, just a token, just a beacon, just a flag for you. And he says, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Same mountain. God brought the children of Israel to this mountain to give the commandments. Way back when God first called Moses, he said, here's going to be a little token. He said, you're going to come back right here and serve me. Wow. Can you imagine as Moses then approached that mountain? He said, I've been here before. There's my token. How do I know I'm doing the will of God? How do I know God's real? How do I know God's really going to work? Because he said, I'm coming right back here. And here we are. I don't know if he was coming around a corner. I don't know if he was climbing over another mountain. I don't know if he could see it in the distance. But as they were marching and as God was bringing them on those eagles' wings, bringing them through all those things back to that place, there was that promised token. God says, I told you I was going to bring you back here. I told you you were going to serve me in this place. So as he stood there saying, this is the place. This is the very, I can almost see Moses saying, Joshua, come here. It was right there. It was right, but somewhere right in there. It's not here anymore, but there was a bush right there. There was a bush right there on fire, and I came, and God said he was going to deliver Israel and use me. 
Oh, look at there. There it is. This is where we were. Oh, I tell you what, what an exciting thing that must have gone into Moses' heart. Moses' heart must have been joy looking back. Joy that he was following God. Joy that he'd been obedient to God. Boy, I tell you, it's an exciting thing in your life and my life when we get those little tokens. I mean, when you get to the place and say, how in the world did I get here? But I know I'm here because God brought me here. I didn't think I'd ever make it. I didn't think we would ever know it. But here it is. God brought me. God gives us those little tokens along the way. As he was standing there at that little token, he said, this is the spot. This is the mountain. There it is. And God's talking to me. Just like he told me he's going to bring me right back here as we delivered the children of Israel. Come back here to serve him. He was saying, I'm glad I stuck with it. I'm glad I didn't quit. I'm glad when Pharaoh says, get out of my face, I'm not going to let him go. I didn't quit. I'm glad when Pharaoh threatened me, I didn't quit. I'm glad when the children of Israel got mad that I was trying to deliver them because now they have to work harder and they were beaten harder. I'm glad when they ridiculed me, I didn't quit. I'm glad when we got to the Red Sea, I didn't quit. I'm glad when we got across the Red Sea and the people were getting ready to stone me because they didn't have any water. I'm glad I didn't quit. Why do you know you, know, you, you succeeded? Because here's a token God has given to me. Oh, got any tokens in your life? I'll tell you something else I'm sure Moses thought. If not, I would have thought it. What happened if I had given up? I'd have lost my token. If I'd have quit when it got hard, I'd not have this token. If I'd have quit when I got discouraged, I'd not have the token. If I'd have quit when everybody else was ridiculing me, I'd not have the token. As God says, I'm bringing you to the place that my people, that I might spend time with them and they might meet with me. He gave Moses that token. In other words, Moses was being rewarded by getting that token because he had taken God at his word and followed. By faith. By faith. You and I, we need to claim God's promises by faith and let God give us some tokens. Oh, he may, we may not have a promise along the way, or we, God may give us a promise from His Word and say, I'm going to claim that promise. God, I'm going to claim that promise that all things work together for them to love you or are called according to your purpose. So God, I'm going to go ahead and do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to claim that promise, and I'm going to keep following you, and I'm going to keep serving you, and I'm going to keep doing what you want me to do. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I don't understand it, but I'm going to do it. And one day, you'll round the corner, and whoa, there's that flag. Whoa, there's that token. Whoa, there's that that mountain. Whoa, there's the fulfillment of what God promised you way back in the beginning. Can I get a little help this morning? I know that now at my age, 60, none of your business. Boy, I tell you what, there's been some times along the way I said, I don't think we'll ever make it. I don't think we're ever going to get there. But I tell you what, there's times when something happens in my life or I see something that God is doing to other people around me, I can say, there's a little token, there's a little flag. There's, in other words, there's a fulfillment of God's promise. That's what Moses, that's what God was telling Moses. Here's a token. There'll be a fulfillment of my promise. Here's a token. There's going to be showing that I can do what I say. Here's a token that my plan is in progress. And so when Moses got to that place, he said, there it is. By the way, Moses wasn't leading them. God was leading them by the pillar of fire and cloud. And so as Moses was following that cloud, he said, okay, guys, let's go. Here we're going. Round, I don't know, around in the corner over the hill. He said, there it is. And God parked him right there. Wow. I'm sure he said, there's the token. Back to this mountain that he called me up. Moms and dads, let your family know some tokens also. Say, God brought you to this place. God told us to do this. God led us this way. So we find a promise token very quickly. We find not just the promise token, but we find his peculiar treasure. His peculiar treasure. He said, we've got to lay out some things along the way. He said, before you're really ready to meet with me, he says, you've got to remember why I brought you here. If you're going to have really a meeting with me that's going to be effective, same thing for you and I. He said, you have to understand how I brought you here. It was by my grace and by my strength and by my power because I love you and I want you here. And my promises are real. If we're going to have a good meeting, he says, I'm going to have a meeting. He said, you have to know my promises are real. My promises are secure. You can trust it. You can look for the tokens, if you will, the fulfillment of my promises. He he said, but not only that, he said, I want you to be a peculiar treasure. Look at verse number five. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice, indeed. By the way, when God says indeed, he says for real. In today's vernacular, it would be for real. 
Do you ever hear your kids say, for real? You say, yes, for real. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice, indeed, for real, sincerely, completely, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. He's saying all the people of the earth are mine. Everything in the earth is mine. He said, but you can be a peculiar people unto me. You can be a special treasure to me because all the earth is mine. Verse number six. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So we see, first of all, a proposition to the people. A proposition to the people. He says there in verse number 5, if, if, he said, if you'll obey, ye shall be a peculiar treasure, listen carefully, unto me. Unto who class? Me. Unto God. See, this is not, this proposition isn't about salvation, but fellowship. It's not about salvation. It's about a joy. It's about a feeling. He says, unto me. He said, if you'll do what I command, you'll do what I ask, and you obey, he said, you will be a peculiar treasure unto me. By the way, as we read through this passage several times, it talks about unto me, God says. Unto me, God says. See, that's the key. Our life is based upon what we mean to him. Our focus has to be unto God. Not, to, not under my spouse, not under my co-workers, not under the pastor, but unto God. He said, you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me. He said, you'll have that special place. You'll have that special position. He says, unto me. The word peculiar treasure there in the Hebrew literally means a carefully shut up wealth, a jewel. A specially shut up wealth or a jewel. He said, if you'll... Hear my commands and do them indeed and follow those. He said, you'll be a jewel to me. You'll be a special treasure to me. I think of the illustration of Malachi 3.16. Are you still with me? I hope you catch these this morning. In Malachi 3.16, in Malachi the children of Israel, many, 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 many years later than this or most folks are away from God, not caring about God, just dissing God all over. And it says, And they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another. Even at those, that time when nobody seemed to care about God, there was a crowd. There was a small group that feared the Lord and spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. So in other words, in that day, in the day of Malachi... Even God's people weren't God's people. They didn't care about God. They were stealing from God. They just ridiculed God. They went over. But there was a little group that did speak often about his name. They'd go down to Starbucks and talk about the Lord. They'd go to Black Bear Restaurant and order chicken fried steak, Boston cream pie, and talk about the Lord. Well, anyway, they got together and talked about the Lord. And he heard it, and he liked it. And he took a book and had it written down, what they were saying about him. And it goes on, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man that spareth his son. He said, if you'll go ahead and obey me, he said, I brought you here. I brought you on eagle's wings so you can be with me. I delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians. I saved you and brought you here. He said, now that you're saved, now that you're delivered, if you will just obey and you'll just hearken to my commands and follow after what I say, he said, you'll be a peculiar treasure to me. You'll be so special to me. You'll be a jewel to me. Unto me, he said. I think it's interesting. He did not give them this proposition, for lack of a better word, this if they will, for salvation. He brought them out first. They're free. They are his people. He said, I want you to be a special. They already are. They've been delivered. He didn't say, obey my voice and I'll deliver you. No. 
He said, now that you're delivered, now that you're saved, now I've carried you by angel wings. He says, now, he says, you're my people, you're out here in the wilderness. He said, but if you'll obey my voice, if you'll keep these things, you'll be a peculiar treasure. You'll be a jewel to me. I believe it's there in your notes. They were forced to obey by the lash, but now they're free to obey by love. See, in, the, in Egypt, they obeyed their masters because they were beaten that way. In the flesh, they were beaten. They had to obey. They were underneath bondage. He said, now I've delivered you. Now I brought you out. Now that you're my people. He said, would you obey me in love? See, child of God, that makes all the difference. I don't, have to serve, I don't have to obey him to be saved. I ought to obey him. I ought to desire to obey him because I am saved. And he has delivered me. And now he's saying, I want you to, well, in Romans 6, 20. For when you were the servants of sin, back in Egypt, if you will, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. He said, now that you're free, he said, I want you to act like you're free. Now you're free from Egypt, which is a picture of sin. A free from Egypt, which is a picture of the devil. He said, now I want you to act like you are. He said, I'm going to make you a kingdom of, of priests and a kingdom of holiness. Verse 6, and ye shall be, look at verse 6, and ye shall be, what's the next two words? Unto me, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Wow. He said, if you'll just do that, he said, you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me. You'll be a jewel unto me. They're, they're already his people. He's already chosen them. That's not going to make a deciding factor. That's not a deciding factor. That They've already been set free. That's not a deciding factor. He says, but now that you're free, I want you to be a jewel. He said, I need you to act and be treated as what you already are, priests in a holy nation. In Deuteronomy 26, later on, Moses is talking about it and says, And the Lord hath vouched thee this day to be his peculiar people. He said, I want you to be my peculiar people, my treasure, my gem. As he hath promised thee that thou shouldest keep all his commandments, and to make thee high above all nations which he hath made in praise in his name and in honor, and that thou mayest be a holy people unto the Lord thy God as he has spoken. He said, I want you to be a holy people to me. I want you to be a kingdom of priests to me. Be able to come right to me. I want you to be a jewel to me. He said, I've already delivered you. I've already brought you through on eagle's wings. I've brought you to this place to be with me. He says, now, he said, if you'll do that. You can be that peculiar treasure. Look at verse number 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. I like that little expression. He laid and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words. You say, what he's talking about? He preached to them right in their face. I mean, he got right down in their face and said, this is what God says. God says you want to be a jewel, you need to obey. God says you want to be unto him a jewel. In other words, a jewel to him, you've got to obey. If you want to be a priest in a holy nation, he says you need to understand his commands and follow it. He's got right in his face, in their face, and preached to him. By the way, we all need in your face preaching. Oh, I need in my face preaching. I, if I go to church and I don't feel like my toes ever get stepped on or ever even get close to my toes, or if I feel like God has never really spoke to me, never convicted me, there's nothing in the Word of God that's there to change me, and I feel good about myself completely, that, boy, I am just one wonderful person, then I missed it somewhere along the way. Church, well, I like leaving church feeling good. You can get right with God and you'll feel good. But Moses preached right in their face. So you and I today, God wants us to be a peculiar people to Him. A peculiar treasure. A jewel to Him. A nation of priests. By the way, when you got saved, you became a priest. We can go, He's made us kings and priests in Christ Jesus. He said, now I want you to act that way. How do I act like a priest? Obey. How do I act like the king? Obey. 
and you'll be that peculiar pressure. In 1 Peter 2.9 refers to that. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. He said, this is what you need to be. He said, as God saved you and you begin to follow him, he said, God wants you to be that peculiar treasure, that peculiar people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Why? That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which at a time past were not a people, but now are the people of God. Why in the world should we be a royal priesthood? Why should we be a holy nation? Why should we be a peculiar people, a peculiar treasure? Why? To give God all the praise of what He's done for us. Amen. Well, God wants me to be obedient to Him because He's, a, he's an overlord and He wants to control me. No! He knows what's best for me. He knows what, how to bless me. And He knows that through that I can praise Him. Oh, I tell you what, a peculiar treasure. We find the proposition very quickly. We find the pronouncement by the people. Look at verse number 8. We're almost there. Verse number 8. So God says, go tell them this. How I got them there. I carried them on angels' wings just to bring them to here. And I want them to be a peculiar treasure unto me. And they'll be priests unto me. And holy nation unto me. Again, we've got to focus on unto God. Unto God. Not am I better than the pastor. Not am I better than my spouse. But how am I as a relationship unto God? Verse number 8. So Moses said that to him. He laid it in their face. He preached it in their face. And all the people answered together. I love this. And said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Here's what's interesting. They agreed to do what God said without being told what God was going to say. He brought them to give them the Ten Commandments. And he said, now you do what I tell you. You follow my commands. He said, you'll be unto me a royal, a, a royal nation, of a kingdom of priests, and you'll also be that peculiar treasure to me. And they says, we will. They said yes to God's commands before God gave them the command. Now, if you sign a piece of paper at the bank or downtown, say, I'll do whatever you tell me to do, I got a bridge in New York City I want to sell you. We said that's not very wise. But you know what? We can have confidence and say, God, whatever you tell me to do, I'll be willing to do it. Because we know He's only going to do what's best for me. We only know that He loves me and He cares for me. And I can say, God, what? by the way, that's the Christian life. That's by faith. I don't know what's happening, but God, I'm going to follow. God, I don't know where we're going. But you do. God, I don't know how we're going to get there, but you do. I don't know what's going to happen when we get there, but you do. So the children of Israel said, oh, whatever he says, we will do. We're going to do it. Now, unfortunately, they're just like regular Baptists, and they didn't mean it so much. We're going to find just in a chapter or two over, the next thing you know, they're dancing and drinking and carousing and having idols. But at that moment, they say, we're going to do it. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, can we get to the place where we say, God, whatever you say, I'll do. Whatever your commands are, I'll do. Wherever you lead, I will follow. God says, we're going to have a meeting. I said, I brought you here to have a meeting with me. Oh, boy, we're going to have, see him. We're going to hear him. We'll see him on the mountain. We're going to get the law. How do we get prepared for that? You need to make sure that you say, yes, whatever it is, I will do. Because in Jeremiah 29 11 for God says for I know the thoughts I think toward you see I can trust him because I know God's thoughts toward me saith the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end I can say God whatever you want I will do that's what he said whatever God says we're going to do it I can say that because I know his thoughts of me are of peace and not evil. God has no evil intent for my life, but peace for my life, joy for my life, good ends for my life. So when God says, right now, if you and your life are fighting something God said to do, and you say, I'm not going to do that. God says, I want you to change over here. You say, I'm not going to do that. You are missing the expected end God has for you. Oh, that we be like the children of Israel and answer, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. 1 John 5, 2. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. There's no period there. That's in your notes. Look down there. That we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. I've got to do what, God? 
Oh, okay, God, I'll tithe. Oh, it's going to hurt. It's going to be miserable. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it. It's such a... No. God, I'm supposed to, to do this. I'm supposed to do that. Oh, it's... I'm not supposed to do that. Is that your command? Oh, I'll do it, but it's... No, no, no. If I'm loving God, it's not grievous. That's why the children of Israel said, Bro, you delivered us. You carried us on eagle's wings out here. You're going to meet with us. Whatever you're going to say, we will obey. Very quickly, we find our, prep, prop, our preparation taught. And I'm just going to give you the short answer to this morning. You have to come back tonight when God says how to prepare to meet with Him. But our preparation is taught. He said, get ready. Get ready. Verse number 11. And be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. He says, get ready. God's coming. Get ready. You're going to have that meeting with God. Get ready. By the way, I'm glad God wants us to be ready. Amen. They knew the time. How many days? Three days. He said, in three days, he's coming down. You've got three days to get ready. You've got three days. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But on that third day, he said, you know when it's coming. Guess what? God's coming back. When? I don't know. He didn't give me a calendar. They've got the calendar. They know in three days God's coming down. We don't know when God's coming down. But He is coming. For all of us, there is a time that we will face God. And we don't know when it is. If you're here this morning, you're not sure you're saved. You need to be ready. And be ready against the third day. They knew it was going to be the third day. We have no idea. We have no idea on the day of our death or, or, or the rapture. We have no idea. But there is an appointment. Hebrews 9, 27. As an appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You and I, if Jesus doesn't call us out by way of the rapture, there's an appointment called death. And if we die without being saved, if we die without having Jesus in our heart, if we die without being born again, hell is where we open our eyes. The Bible says, and in hell, the rich man opened his eyes. He was not ready. He was not ready for death. Be ready for death. I'm not looking to get on the next train, but when my ticket's ready, I'm ready. Because at age 19, I realized I was a sinner headed for hell. But God loved me and already paid the price for me. Paid the sin debt. And promised that if I would come and call upon Him and trust Him and believe on Him and lean upon Him and accept Him, not just into my life as a good luck charm, not just as a way of living, but accept Him as my Savior, fall upon my face, call upon Him, He promises to save. And from that moment on, I've been prepared as far as salvation goes. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Revelation 21, 27. And there shall no wise, talking about heaven, no wise, that means no way, enter into it, heaven, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh an abomination or maketh a lie. No lying goes on. No liars get in there. Nothing that defiles going in there. Nothing that works an abomination goes into heaven. Well, who is going to heaven? But they which are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, not because I'm good, but because He is. He, the just for the unjust, the sinless one for the sinner, died for me. Be ready. Are you ready this morning? If you died right now, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? I am. Not because I'm a Baptist, not because I was baptized, because at age 19 I trusted Christ as my Savior. And he saved me. If you're not saved, then you get saved today. Christian, say, preacher, I am saved. Good, are you ready? Are you ready? We don't have the three days. But sometime soon, meeting with God, 
meeting with God. Let's bow our heads, please. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for, as we look at the children of Israel, as a picture of us, how you've worked so much that we might come unto you. You died on the cross so we could come unto you. Your blood cleanses us from our sin that we can come unto you. Father, if there's somebody here this morning that's not saved, not sure they're on their way to heaven, Lord, let this be the day they get that settled. Please, God, you've done so much. You've paved the way. You've opened the door. You offer us the gift of eternal life. For those who are feeling the tug in their heart, let today be the day they get that settled. Today the day they get that saved. Lord, for those of us that are saved, let us be ready to give an account. So, Father, I don't know we covered lots of ground this morning, Lord. Holy Spirit, I trust that you have and will continue to work on the points, the pieces of conviction, the things we need as individuals today. Holy Spirit, just take control. We will carefully give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. So we stand to our feet while the piano plays. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, you step out right now. We'll have a man with a man, lady with a lady, take the word of God and show you from the Bible how to be saved. It's not by joining the church. It's not by turning over a new leaf. It's being born again, being saved, trusting in Christ. Are you ready? Say, I brought you unto me. Say, I want you to be ready. Well, what else has God spoken to you about today? Maybe it's just you realize you had not got any tokens in your life from God because you've not followed. I want you to decide today, I want some tokens for my life. I'm going to let God give me some tokens. I'm going to take some promises that He's given, and I'm going to follow Him, stay close with Him, obey Him, so when the end comes, there can be some tokens in my life. I can say, wow, I'm here, just like God promised. He delivered me just like He promised. He provided for me just like He promised. Make a decision for God today.